and the higher tones are... The man undergoing armchair medical treatment is a 38-year-old with a family history of heart problems. What he needs is a new drug-free way of controlling his own high blood pressure. It's kind of a silent killer. Whatever mechanisms control blood pressure uh, are not inherent in my family. And at a certain age, everybody gets high blood pressure. So uh, that's the real reason that I wanted biofeedback. Biofeedback is a surprisingly simple technique. All it involves is an instrument that shows you what is going on inside your body. This is showing your muscle tension. In Jim's case, he sees a display of his own skin temperature and soon learns that he can raise or lower this at will. And because skin temperature depends on blood flow, he finds this talent also gives him control over his blood pressure. After a few weeks of doing it, I, it changed my life because uh, many things that you think are um, out of control really are within your uh, means of controlling. Which is a large... Biofeedback is not limited just to heart problems. It can also provide relief to those who suffer from chronic migraine. Want to flee the situation? Boy, when I was growing up my whole life, I suffered, you know, even as a child, um, from migraines with the kind that would put me in the hospital, and, and they couldn't give you anything. They couldn't do anything for you. So biofeedback for me is the, the perfect choice because it's something that I can take control of, especially when I'm in a really, really high level of pain. Shauna's treatment is similar to Jim's, but involves feedback about her muscle tension. She not only sees a graphic display of her stress, but hears a tone that rises and falls with the level of her anxiety. Is the, your hand temperature. the reason why we have a tone in biofeedback is so that the person can hear changes, very subtle changes in hand temperature or muscle tension. And by hearing that moment to moment, they're able to guide themselves to do more of the same. Shauna concentrates first on her shoulder muscles, where tension is most obvious. She works on lowering the tone she hears by deliberately relaxing these muscles, teaching her body to recognize its own state and to change it. You don't feel anything when you're hooked up. I mean, it's not like there's any kind of um, you know, electrical current that you're feeling, anything like that. What you really you're concentrated on your body and you're concentrated on your breath. The power of the body to heal itself is extraordinary. And with a little help from the mind, it may even provide a cure for cancer. Garrett Porter was just nine years old when he was first diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor. He was given a short time to live and released to the care of clinical psychologist Patricia Norris. Now, 20 years later, thanks to her imagination and his courage, Garrett is still alive. Garrett was the first cancer patient that I ever worked with. I've been wanting to do it for uh, several years, in fact, since 1972, when I saw some other spectacularly effective work with cancer patients. When I was diagnosed, it was like, well, what is a brain tumor? and when my father told me it could kill me, that's when my whole world changed. I was forced to grow up in a hurry. He was thrown in at the deep end, and after a year of intensive radiation and chemical therapy produced no results, he was sent home to die. My parents could see that I was physically deteriorating, and they had uh, pondered about going out and buying the casket, even. And my mother screamed at me, Garrett, if you don't do something, you're going to die. What he did was to work with Pat Norris on a process of visualization. For him, this meant personalizing his cancer, giving it an evil identity, and mobilizing his white blood cells as forces for good, battling with the enemy on his behalf. For Garrett, this fantasy was easy. He created his own private space war. In this, he was the heroic wing commander, leading his squadron in action night after night against the stronghold of the alien invader in his brain. Star Wars had come, just come out, um, and I was very much into that. Garrett 
Garrett visualized and drew voracious little white blood corpuscles gobbling away at his tumor, mirroring the microscopic view of his real life war against disease. It was very real to me, um, and it uh, became much more than a game. It became a, um, you know, an epic struggle uh, between good and evil. And uh, every night I would see that, that damn tumor destroyed. Every day for six months, Garrett fought his private war. Until one night, there was nothing to fight. The enemy seemed to have disappeared. And all of a sudden, we come out of hyperspace, and there's no tumor there. He checked again, this time with more starships, but still no sign. So the next day, he went into hospital for a CAT scan, and they waited with some anxiety for the results. The doctor goes, well, there's no concussion, and the tumor's gone. Mom jumps out of that chair. The tumor's gone? Scares the doctor half to death and you know kind of kind of fades back and says well Yeah, the tumor's gone and by the way, did you have it surgically removed? And of course there was no surgery um, And the only thing that was left was a little white spot of calcification That I had actually seen in my visualization That's cool Garrett is now 29 years old and a scanner for the Civil Air Patrol in Kansas, a fitting sequel to his own starship fantasy. Now he searches for downed aircraft and helps to rescue flyers who are lost or injured. When I was a child, um, I was fighting for my own life. Um, this time I'm fighting for everybody else's. Um, and uh, I think that's one thing that that I came out of uh, the whole experience with cancer with is that I, you know, lives are important. Uh, I want to save lives. I want to be out there. I want to help as much as I can. Garrett's visualization of white blood cells as starships helped him to fight back against his brain tumor. Now that same technique is being used in a computer game to assist children like six-year-old Julie to control her own brain waves. The jet engines are linked to an EEG, and they fire only when her brain is producing a particular frequency. Normally, we don't know anything about this. The brain operates at anything from one to 22 cycles per second, depending on what we are doing at the time. But for people with neurological problems, it can be useful to produce more of the restful middle frequencies. Julie is using this technique, called neurofeedback, to help her brain relax. The spaceship to which she is connected only fires its engines when her brain waves lie between 8 and 12 cycles per second. When she strays outside this range, the game stops. The only way to get it going again is to wait until her brain settles on the right frequency once more. And each time she is made aware of this connection, it becomes easier to make it happen again. For Julie, this is still a game. But by playing it, she exercises her mind in a manner that changes the whole way her brain works. At Manchester University in England, they've discovered that just thinking about exercising could help to keep us fit. Right, Andy, if you wanna put Sports psychologist Dave Smith talks an athlete through an imaginary run right, while monitoring his heartbeat. Your 200 metres, so it's very, very important that you give an absolute maximum effort here. I want you to run as fast as you possibly can. On your marks. Get set. Go! For an athlete conditioned to respond to starting orders, the words alone are sufficient to start adrenaline flowing and to persuade the body that an effort will soon be required. Instantly, the heart rate climbs. But after about 15 seconds, the brain realizes that the race is not real and turns off most of the machinery. But enough excitement still seeps through from the brain to the body 
to raise the athlete's heart rate by a total of about 20 beats per minute, even though he has never moved a muscle. Mental preparation is obviously a vital part of physical fitness, but Dave Smith goes even further. He believes that muscle tone can be improved by thought alone, and to prove this, he set up an experiment involving the human body's least used muscle, the one that moves our little finger. One group of subjects, exercising twice a week, tries to strengthen that muscle alone by pressing the little finger repeatedly against the side of a metal tube. The other group are encouraged, while using the same apparatus, to do nothing but think about performing the same finger exercise. Imagining performing the strength training does promote significant strength gains. The results aren't actually as good as actually performing the task, but they are significant. Specifically, in our last study, we found that individuals who actually did the strength training improved their strength by about 30%, and individuals who imagined performing it improved by about 16%. So, could this mean the end of exercise? Could we become fit just by thinking about it? The results clearly aren't as good as actually going out and performing exercise. However, what they do mean is that, for example, when people are unable to exercise due to illness or injury, they may obtain some of the benefits from imagining performing the exercise. If the mind can give the body a virtual workout that is nevertheless half as good as the real thing, what else is possible? At Georgetown University in Washington, Candace Pert believes that thought on its own can also have a direct effect on the immune system. She has discovered chemical connections between the mind and the body, and these prove that it is impossible to have a thought of any kind that doesn't change you physically. Every time we have a thought, a mood shift, a feeling, it's not that it's just happening up above your head in your brain. It's really happening simultaneously all over what I've actually called your body-mind. Chemicals are released and these little molecules are diffusing all over the body through the bloodstream, binding to receptors, thus having the potential to change everything from a rate of digestion to the size of a tumor. Professor Pert believes that her chemicals are what make it possible for someone like Garrett Porter to open up a channel between his mind and his body and to think his tumor away. Consciousness can actually eat the physical molecules, can change the physical molecules. This is very radical. This is very big. This is as big as realizing that the Earth revolves around the sun. It seems there is no real division between the mind and the body. Both work together as part of the human whole, and changes in one influence the other. Nothing is all in the mind, or just physical. We seem to be extraordinary mixtures of mind and matter, able almost to use one to create the other. Each one of us certainly has the power, and science has now given us the means to take personal responsibility for our own well-being. We can control our own pain, look after our own fitness, and take drug-free action against infection. In Dr. Escudero's surgery, Rosa has been on the operating table for 20 minutes. And if her operation is like all the others here, she should suffer from no post-operative complications. Rosa seems none the worse for her experience, and very happy to leave the theater, not on a trolley, but on her own two feet. She also leaves the hospital immediately, and strolls home with her husband as though nothing has happened. Nothing, that is, except another extraordinary natural mystery.